dear Vasily, we are extremely happy to have many weeks working and making music with you here in Oslo. But uh, many years ago, where did it all start? Uh, start? Who and what brought you into the classical music world as a child? Well, it started quite a lot of years ago. When I was uh, six years old, my parents, they brought me to the very special school in Leningrad by then. Uh, Boys Capella School, which is one of the oldest music schools in Russia, founded even by Peter the Great. And uh, they just put me into the school. The school has nearly 300 years of history. Mm. And originally it was funded by the Tsars to manufacture or educate the singers for their private church. Mm. And of course in Orthodox religion, originally in a pure Orthodox, only males allowed, only men allowed to sing in the church. And for that, there was constantly for nearly 250 years only boys school. And then of course communists, when they came to power, they changed the direction because religion was prohibited. So they changed it and they started to manufacture the choral conductors. Mm. Because <laughs> it was plant economy in Soviet Union, there were about 250 professional choirs, fully paid, so it was like a full-time job for mm. people uh, all around the country. And of course, for plants, they were needed to replace a conductor who were either dying, who were leaving, who were going to maternity leave, to many normal natural reasons. And uh, this there were two schools, one in Moscow, one in St. Petersburg and Leningrad. And both were manufacturing like eight to ten conductors each. So they calculated exactly <laughs> how many they need. And at the end of the school, you had nearly guaranteed workplace. Maybe not in a big city, maybe somewhere in Siberia. Mm. But you would have a job and you would have, by the Soviet standards, decent salary. And the school was very, very prestigious. So at the when I was six, there were 450 boys on 25 places. Wow. And then if you are selected in those 25, you need to study 10 years. And every year, if you have the lowest points, the worst points, as a result of the year you eliminated, you sent to the normal school. So at the end, from 25, there's so only no more than 10 were allowed to finish. And of course, it's highly competitive system nearly like Olympic system in, in a sport, maybe like nowadays in some countries like China, perhaps. Mm. And uh, it was tough. Was it an addition to get into the school? Yes, you you need yes, year six. I do remember, of course, bits of it. I do remember that they were checking that we have music hearing. Mm. So you turn around to the piano and then uh, the teacher who auditioning you put a chord of three notes and then you have three attempts when you turn around to copy that mm. and just to find the same chord which he or she just did and then there there was sense of rhythm they were clapping certain rhythm and then you need to repeat certain rhythm and they were checking the voice because the boys choir actually was very very famous mm. by that time and was probably the best boys choir in the country so then they were checking that we have voice. Actually, quite a lot of singers nowadays in Mariinsky, mm. they are uh, from this generation. Daniel Stoder, famous tenor, I sat with him on the same table. Denis Sidov, quite famous baritone. Sergei Skarachodov, nowadays a tenor. Uh, there's quite a lot, actually, more or less familiar names. Uh, because we all were selected mm. from so many people. But did you also learn many different instruments? You need to learn piano. Piano is obligatory. Mm. It starts from learning piano actually exactly at the first day mm. at the, uh, when you are seven. But that's a lot of different disciplines. Apart from musical disciplines, there were also all the normal disciplines. Literature, language, maths, uh, geography, later physics, biology, g everything. Mm. And uh, for that, there was six days a week. School Saturdays were working days as well, study mm. days. And it started at nine in the morning. It was finishing about three o'clock, the group, group lessons. And then the private lessons started after that. Singing, piano, later conducting, and you can choose instrument on your choice if you want. So literally, I was living in the north of the city, and St. Petersburg is a big city, and it took me about an hour and a quarter to go by public transport 
to the school and from the school. So I was leaving something like 7.30, and I was coming back from about 7.30 in the evening. And then, of course, you have a lot of homework. So you're doing the homework, and then you go to sleep. So for me, the big reward was if I could play football on Sunday for an hour or two with my mates uh, at the yard. But it's not always for happening, because we had a concert on Sunday mm. by, the, by the choir, quite often, actually. Mm. No, it, it gives you the big discipline, mm -hmm. uh, the work rate, it teaches you how to work all the time and not getting tired. It also brings you, uh, it brings to you actually this feeling that there's reward at the end of the work, mm -hmm. which is I think very important for the children especially. Yes. And what is, I, might s I must say for in the experience of my children, it's something what's missing in the current system. They get everything, not my children only, but all the children mm. at the moment, I mm. think much easier than they yes. need to. So for that, of course, they're happier. They have an easier life than... Until a certain point, yeah, maybe. Yeah, but as a children, yes. they are happier. Yes. And they have much easier life than I had, for instance. But uh, this relation between how much work you need to put and how much effort mm. you need to put to yes. achieve something, this is what we were given in the school. And my schoolmates, they all very successful people. Not all of them in the music. Uh, actually, some of them working in just insurance business or banking business earn much more money than I am, for instance. Mm -hmm. In the financial terms, they're much more successful. Uh, but they're all very successful. Mm. So your parents were not musicians? Uh, it's a story. My mother, she actually had music education. She finished the music school as probably 90% of Soviet girls at the years of 7 to 12. Mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, she never worked as a musician. She always was a teacher in universities. Actually uh, taught a really strange discipline which called the Soviet management, which I, I'm not so sure what it is exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, they mainly, so far as I have seen, uh, they mainly were preparing the people who were working in the shops and checking the quality of the goods. So, uh, because again, it's a central economy. So, if the part, big party of some goods coming to the shop, there needs to be the person who is responsible, who knows exactly that the quality needs to be up to standards, mm. and who checks it. Mm. And mm. that's whom they were preparing all the time. Then, of course, uh, in the post-Soviet period, it's changed, and they, they were trying to make managers and uh, negotiators as well. Uh, but she never worked as a musician. And my father, he's an engineer by education. But mm -hmm. he spent quite a few years in Leningrad, Dixieland, playing double bass, just pizzicato. I do remember double bass at home. <laughs> yeah. Never remember bow. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then the band uh, decided to change. And so he was playing in a bass guitar in restaurants for quite a long time. Mm. And then in the 90s, he decided to leave because uh, there were quite often shooting in restaurants, so uh, he said that it's too dangerous. And then he went back to engineering and actually was working in the building constructing industry. Mm. So they are not musicians in a classical sense, but yes. they are musical. Ma I asked my mother why did she decided to bring me to such school. Mm. And she said that I was very early child. I started to read at the age of two and I read not just children books but I started to read a bit more advanced literature because I wanted not because she pushed me so much and I was a bit selfish so uh, and we lived in a very simple part of the city um, most of the kids they were from very 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 simple families not intelligence as it called mm. but mainly just workers mm. and they were less advanced at this age and I my mother said to me and I started to behave them like, like you know I'm a king you don't know anything about life, even at the very early age, like four or five. Mm. And then she wanted to put me into an environment mm. where I will be equal with others, that I will lose this bad behavior. And actually, we are. We were very, very gifted people around. Mm. And then you can feel, you can sense that there is a competition. You are, you respect the other people. You learn this respect much sooner. I think mm. if I would study in a normal school, who knows what, <laughs> what will be my character. And uh, growing up in St. Petersburg, you had an exceptional opportunity of uh, experiencing the leading conductors 
Is there anybody in particular that many, stands out to you? Many, many. I remember the last one of the last concerts by Maravinsky even. Uh, 1983, I was just seven years old. Mm. And I remember, if not 82, I remember that because uh, there was Schubert and Unfinished Symphony in the first mm. half, and then there was Bruckner in the second half. And uh, with Schubert, I felt the sadness, and my impression still quite vivid from that concert. I felt sadness of the music. I felt this sense of tragedy in the music. Mm. Uh, but then from Bruckner it scared me because uh, he was hyper intellectual, of course. Mm. And uh, especially at towards the end of the life, you can sense the construction, you can sense this cathedral in Bruckner's music, which I understood later. Mm. Uh, but for the child, uh, there was probably too much to get. And then I remember uh, Lenny Bernstein coming first time, I think, that was first visit of New York Phil to mm -hmm. Soviet yeah. Union or to Russia. And that was a big, big discovery because from what we have seen, mm, uh, the music in Soviet Union is supposed to be played with a very serious face, with a very serious approach. And it's a really hard work and a tough job, and everyone needs to respect that. Mm. And then we've seen New York Phil and Lenny, who had so much fun on stage. And then the music can be played equally great, with totally different behavior and totally different character. For us, there was pff, a big happening and kind of eye-opening moments. Mm. Then I remember Sir George Schulte later mm. coming to conduct, actually, St. Petersburg Phil, mm. uh, with program of Beethoven and Brahms. And uh, he, he's, he was very, very tough person and very tough character, I think. And I, I was already what, 14, maybe 15 years old, so I can't remember the things about it. And I knew that I'm in the music. Mm. I didn't knew that I would be a conductor for sure, but I was studying music already quite seriously. And I can see this tension between the orchestra who doesn't want to follow because uh, St. Petersburg Field traditionally was playing Beethoven with a very heavy Russian approach to the music, sort of grand. Uh, and Scholte had totally different ideas mm. about how to perform the music. And he was suggesting to them bowing and other stuff. Uh, but the orchestra didn't want it to change. Mm. And they were in kind of clash with him on the rehearsal. Not only on the dress rehearsal, I can see how the orchestra, because they had no choice. Mm. That's a concert tonight. Mm. And on the dress rehearsal, they started to try to do what he wanted. And actually, I can see how they enjoyed Oh, look, that works. This bowing or this breath, everything. Oh, that's interesting. We can Actually, we can play that. Mm. And then in the concert, they followed him. And they followed what he wanted initially. And that was one of the best Beethoven Brahms programs by the standards of uh, St. Petersburg Phil I've ever seen. But example was, for me, is how tough and how confident you need to be in what you want and what is really good for them. And then I came back after, uh, introduced myself as a very young student, said, you know, Sir George, I'm a young student conductor, uh, so what will be your advice to me? I have seen your rehearsals. And he said to me the thing which I, by then I didn't understand, but now I'm understanding it more and more. He said to me, I wish you just one thing. I wish your music will always be your hobby. <laughs> and he's absolutely right. Once you start to make money by music, once you start to think it's a profession, I need to work from 10 to 2 and just play the notes or conduct, rehearse, and then do the concert, go home, and then have a nice life. Once you stop loving it, mm. uh, it's not a life. You know, much easier to earn much more money in a different professions. Mm. Uh, the, the work of orchestra musician, the work of anybody in the classical music industry, very hard. And actually nowadays not rewarding much, apart from this pleasure from playing music. Mm. So for that, that was a big lesson. And of course, I've seen a lot of performances by Gergiev in Mariinsky Theatre. I've seen a lot of concerts by Temir Kanov, by Janssens. Now, there were other conductors named Yarvi, who was coming very regularly. So quite, quite a lot of influence. But I always was, uh, I, I never had one role model. Mm. I always was thinking, what can I pick 
as the best from this or that conductor? How can I use this or that quality by him or her? And I always was also thinking, oh, that's what I definitely don't want to pick because all this negative experience is also very important. Yeah. That's, you know, how it shouldn't work. So there were many, mm. many, many, many influences. And actually, I must admit that the concert life in late 80s, 90s, in St. Petersburg and Leningrad was very, very active because this Iron Curtain was open mm. and a lot of orchestras and artists were just coming for curiosities, for looking uh, for the other experiences, for many other reasons. But there were a lot of guest artists. Actually, almost all the world was there mm. over the years. We were talking about, or you were mentioning, how the m musical world is really hard and tough these days and as a chief conductor you have to take an active part in all aspects of running an orchestra w where what do you see I what is your role well there's there's no secret that a conductor's role at the moment and conductor's job has more and more psychological aspect in mm. it uh, of course you need ideally and the most productive is when the atmosphere in the orchestra is in a good family, where the people are happy to sit together. And I can understand, you know, for some people, they were coming 50 years, day by day, sitting next to each other yeah. for, the, for the job, which is not easy. Even being the nicest person, you still have the same person next to you for 50 years sometime. And this is uh, something what makes the people tired. And of course, you need to calm down the tensions. Of course, you need to work. You need to know what's going on mm. as well. Because this is vital. If the orchestra spent a lot of energy on internal questions and emotions, then there is less energy and less attention left to the music mm. and less attention left to actually what we are for. Mm. And for that, it's very important. There's also importance to work with audience, to work with the youngsters, to be a connective and open point for everyone. Working with the sponsors, working with government, meetings, uh, and this is the part which is non-musical at all. Mm. Is it hard to find a balance? Uh, you never know what is the right balance. So for me, uh, it always has been that, uh, of course, the top priority is music, so I never come to any rehearsal underprepared. I'm always pushing myself to the limits and above the limits because I think that's the only way how I can make music. Uh, I also thinking a lot about the programming of repertoire for this, this season, next season, season after, and a lot about the new soloists, new conductors whom I see here or there, about who will fit, who will work better for this or that orchestra. So there's a lot of this musical part, but there's of course, this upper part which is not related to music and you know even small aspects uh, to just watch how exactly the orchestra bow how important it is for the audience mm. what are emotions what what are we bringing to the audience not just in the music but on top of that as well and uh, there are other things there, there are other things there are interviews there are PR there are mass media so it's quite a full life of course but hey <laughs> this is what you choose. <laughs> yes. M many uh, composers and artists through history, they led tragic lives and lived with uh, existential crisis. You think it's uh, more difficult for us in our material world to experience and imagine such desperation? I don't know. It's difficult to say. Yeah, I think that what I find really different from what it used to be, for instance, like 40, 50 years ago, the world is much more global, much more connected. Uh, if before you come for a guest week somewhere, even in, let's say, you know, Mannheim, <laughs> you do your rehearsal, you finished at two o'clock, and then you are in your hotel, and it's not much to do. You can watch the telly probably, or you can walk around, but there's not much you can interact with the world, not so much you can connect. Yeah. Nowadays, you connect it all the time. And of course, for studying music, that's also so different. Mm. 
Mm. It used to be time you need to study the new piece. You need to order the score, which will go to you by mail, unless you live in a very big city. Mm. You need to order a recording, which also you need to go to the special shop to buy it, or you need to order it online. And if you want to know about the piece, which I always do, I read about the when it was written, why, what was the life at comp of composer at that time, what was the general historical context of the piece, you need to go to library. Now, you take your mobile, in five minutes you have everything. Mm. You have 10 or 15 recordings of the piece. You can have a score, either download it, or if you want to order it, you just order it online. And then if you want to read about the historical context, no problems. You, you can find so much material about it. So in that sense, uh, actually study time, you can use it much more productive because you don't need to wait, you can just go for it. And that's why I think the general level of knowledge of the modern conductors in broader sense uh, is per perhaps higher than it used to be many, mm. many years back. And uh, it also allows you to travel faster, so that's a lot of globe-trotting ideas. And the world goes faster. There's another theory and another tough discussion about shall we follow the pace of the world with the pace of the music? Because mm. there's also a tendency to play the music faster and faster, yeah, naturally. Not just because the orchestras are improved, they can play it faster. Mm. But because uh, with a slower tempo, musicians in the orchestra and audience feels a bit empty. There's not enough drive. And we talk much faster even today than if you S see television from... Yeah, well, that's because you need to put enough adver advertisements in, in, in the right time. And then it's everything. Is, it's, you know, I had this discussion actually with journalists in uh, BBC and uh, there are no news after 48 hours. Any news leaves 48 hours. After it, mm. there's no life. So that's a maximum period. And uh, especially now, we saw the Instagram with uh, technologies, with the clips which are 15 seconds or 35 seconds long. Mm. That's very, very short, which is very scary for the next generation. I must admit, I can see that teenagers nowadays, uh, at the most, they can stay focused for five, maybe 10 minutes. This is a maximum. And what about the same Bruckner symphony? Mm. There's no way they can be focused. They in the five, 10 minutes, they want to tweet or they want to send a Facebook text. So for that, and, and this time I think will be even shorter the time of focusing for the next generation because kids now, they always tweet one phrase and they, they receive one phrase, so they can read the sentence of one phrase, then they jump to another sentence, then jump to another sentence. And this problem of not being able to focus, I think will we'll play quite significant role in the future. Mm. Where do you get your inspiration outside music? Uh, nature, of course. Mm. Of course, nature. Uh, I'm walking quite a lot, I'm a big walker and listening, absorbing, watching. Here in Norway, it's amazing how much inspiration you can get from the nature. Mm. Uh, reading, of course, but you know, all sort of arts. I'm watching movies sometime. I'm looking into some exhibitions. Actually, in two weeks, uh, planning to go to Munch Museum just to see what's up there. There is quite scandalous exhibition yes. at the moment, as I know. But uh, I had no time this mm. week, so hopefully in two weeks' time mm. we'll be there. And having, uh, you have uh, a wife who is also a conductor and two young children. Has having a family changed how, you, how much you work or how you... Well, it changed yourself, of course. Yes. You know, uh, children, they, they are changing you. Of course, and uh, it's very difficult to describe by the words what exactly changed in you when you have this parenthood. Uh, but probably uh, with Sasha, with my son, uh, when he was born, quite soon I realized that there are no more uh, free time in my life left. And it's, it's a lot of time you spend, but you like it. No, you're spending all the time which you were spending before on some other things. You're spending on your child, 
and you really like to do so. It exhausts you, but you really like it. And then this uh, feeling of and understanding of the real values in the world that also change you. Uh, talking about the working rate, of course, you know, sometime you need, instead of study the music, you need to spend it with your child. And that's what you do. Then you sleep less. Mm. Then you spend the night time for, for the music. But uh, it's, uh, you know, it makes your life fulfilled. Mm. Uh, you, you don't understand it before the children start to happen. But once you have them, it, uh, it really filling your life with sense, with motion, with emotions, with everything. Do you, we're talking about the music business, how hard is it? And with, um, uh, with competing with the entire world now, you can see everybody in YouTube from the, when you start at five or four or whatever age, is the music business anything you want for your children? I'm not pushing. My son is playing piano mm. uh, and also, also now started to play saxophone. He wants, okay. Uh, but I'm not trying to make a new Richter from him. I think he will choose a bit later. He's now 11, so maybe in two, three years there will be time when he will choose. Does he want to be a musician or does he want to be someone else? Mm. Uh, the difficulty will be that this generation is highly materialistic. Mm. So when we had a chat last year with my son and the other children about different professions, different occupations. Their first question, not what shall I do to become a musician or what shall I do to become a doctor, but their first question is how much is musician earning per month? How much is a doctor earning per month? And then only according to that, they will think, does it worth effort or not? So not what they really want to but what they think will make them richer and wealthier. And this is, I think, actually fundamentally wrong. Because uh, even if you earn millions, but you hate what you do, then your life is ruined. You will have depressions, you will have all sorts of things. So, for and for, for child especially, I think you need to choose by your heart. You need to choose by what you really want to do and then try to develop yourself into this direction and you know i must admit that 99 percent of the children with whom i was talking about such matters they were always asking can i if i will be a policeman can i then buy iphone 6. so for them the priorities are there this is what was changed in the world nowadays the only global idea sadly nowadays is money nothing else not even religion religion not unite the people anymore there are too many religions and too much tension between religions. And the idea like conquering the space, mission to the Mars. Mm -mm. Mm. The idea about feeding all the people in Africa, for instance, who suffer and who is dying from starvation. No, not interested. But you think the world is um, becoming a better place, even though... For some. Yes. I think that the difference between the poor people and between the extremely rich people getting bigger and bigger. There are some corporations like IKEA who probably has a budget well beyond the budget of the country. And then you have the people who earn nothing, nothing at all. The people who are starving, the people who doesn't have water to drink. And for that, uh, Usually in historical context, in a local, of course, the world is global now, but in a local, in terms of the countries, that led to the wars, usually. Hopefully, I hope that even with all the current tensions in politics, uh, it won't lead to the big global conflict. But hey, you, you see now the small conflicts which are real disaster here and there, and you can see how the ordinary people suffer from that. So for it, it's very difficult to say, do we live, I think materialistically, we definitely live better. Mm. Does it make us happier? Uh, I think it's very personal and subjective answer to this question. Mm. But the cultural life uh, now in, in Russia, how do you see the difference? 
from when you were growing up? Everything is accessible now. Mm. Uh, you know, at least in classical music, there are no sensors. Mm. Everything you can hear this or that performance, and everybody starts to appreciate this or that performance. Uh, up till the last year, there were a lot of touring orchestras going on. Uh, a lot of cities, not just Moscow and St. Petersburg, but also cities in Siberia, they have festivals nowadays where quite a decent amount of guest orchestras coming and guest artists coming and performing. So there was quite active, you know, comparing to the 90s, for instance. But if you compare it to the Soviet time, it's of course less. Mm. Because in Soviet time, this cultural life was used as a uh, distraction from the problems. So communists, they were spending a lot of money and a lot of attention and a lot of support for the artists because that allowed them to say to the people, you know, you have this, let's forget about the other nonsense, as they were talking all the time. And also there was, for many people, there was the only way to go west, mm. to escape mm. the country. Now you want mm. to go, you just buy a ticket and then you fly. So for that, it has changed, mm. and the role of the cultural life, I think, has changed. But to say that it's nothing goes on there, no, it's very. I think it's very intense. Yes, and your old school does it say, still exist? Yes. yes, they. Well, the chorus number, uh, the number of the professional choirs, was so much diminished. Mm -hmm. Now I think it's maybe twenty or thirty left mm -hmm. only. The tragedy that the other people they either requalified for the other professions or they're working like a singers in the church almost for nothing. Mm. Uh, and the school, of course, started to shift as well. So not only the choir conductors, but sound engineers, mm. uh, managers, mm. uh, agents, uh, and also instrumentalists. So the school now started to have a much broader picture. But the choir still exists. Boys choir still doing concerts, even going abroad time mm. to time. Uh, the other part is that it's not any more very prestigious profession. So these uh, 450 pretenders, they're gone. So now they barely have two kids on one place. So if 50 comes to competition, that's a good year. Mm. Some years they couldn't even find. And the reason behind it again, materialism. Mm. You work like a builder, you earn more money than a professional musician in the Soviet Union. In Norway, I think you work like a plumber or electrician, you earn much more money. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I think we have to stay positive and uh, no, of we course. know that what music brings us um, to the audience. Um, I, I think that the orchestra really here, good. the orchestra here in Oslo going forward, we definitely made a big step forward mm -hmm. in our perception and our appreciation of the audience in the way how we play the piece. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, in my point of view, there is a big step forward also in the sound of the orchestra, in the discipline, uh, in the way how we play the pieces, how we feel the music exactly the same way. Uh, there's a lot of positive reaction from the audience mm. regarding this way, there's this openness of the orchestra and this warmth and the heart which the orchestra gives very openly nowadays to, to the audience. There is still plenty of things to improve but i think we are on our path we are moving forward and uh, we will be at the very top very soon